You know, I was sitting with one of my friends on that. And I asked him, and I said to him, explain to me how does this business work? I don't know how it works. And I said to him, how does it work? Now if you listen to this carefully, and I don't want to incite you with this, but I want you to listen to it carefully. Because when someone is in that crowd, everything's happy for him. Man's earning money, man's got car, man's got the women on his arms, man goes clubbing, man drinks, man smokes, man's got everything. But there's one thing that man does all the time. He's always looking over his shoulder. No feds are on him. He's always looking over his shoulder. Rival gang members ain't looking at him. He's always looking over his shoulder. One of his own man ain't gonna snitch him up to the old bill. He's always fearing that. That's the risk factor of this all. However, on the, on the plus side, man's got a mansion. <laughs> the guy's got everything that he wants. Everything he's ever asked for. He's giving his children what he wants. Sad is he's, he's feeding them haram. That's the sad thing. What he's taking in, when he puts that on his child's plate, that very same haram, tell me when he takes that in, isn't that going to affect him? And isn't he going to have something inside him that is going to push him towards that now? Isn't that going to happen to him? Of course. If that's what you're feeding your child, if you feed yourself poison, what happens to you? What happens? You don't fall asleep, do you? You're poisoned. <laughs> if you feed yourself good food, what happens? You get a healthy body. You eat burgers all the time. What happens? You get fat. So whatever you feed yourself is what you're going to get out. So if you're feeding yourself money that has come from unlawful sources, what's going to happen to your kids? That's the question that you ask. So, I asked him, I said, how does it work on that? And then he sat in the car and he explained it down. He broke it all down for me. On that. And he says, it starts from a kilo of heroin in Pakistan. How much is a kilo of heroin in Pakistan? 800 pounds, for example. This man sitting in this country, has his man's working for him. He gets five lads from his crew and says, listen, book your ticket to Pakistan, you're going to go pick up five kilos for me. 800 quid each kilo. You're going to come back with it. Now, science tells you, the human, uh, the scientists have told you, human body tells you, that anyone who injects 100% of heroin will never be able to handle it. Within minutes, the guy's flat out. He's knocked, he's out, he's dead. So that 100% heroin that he's purchased for 800 quid from Pakistan, four of them have, five of them gone, one's got caught by the feds. He's out. How much are left? Four kilos. How much is a kilo in street value today? Anyone know? A kilo of heroin in street value today is 22k to 28k. And even the Dawood Islami brothers are thinking, whoa, <laughs> man alive, this is serious money now. <laughs> Wait till I break it up for you, you're going to think this guy's going to be a millionaire by the end of the night. <laughs> that one kilo of heroin, he can't shot that on the streets because he's going to kill people. People can't handle a kilo. So he's got a kilo and he halves it. And he puts half, you know, sodium, potassium, whatever goes in there. And in the other half, he does that. How many kilos is that now? Two. 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 One kilo worth? 28k. Times it by two. 56k. Two kilos. It's come over the country. It's all legit. He's sitting in his office and the man's got it all in front of him. He can't deal 100% because he's going to kill people. That's murder. So he halves it. Then he quarters it. And from those four quarters, he makes a kilo out of each. And from those quarters, he makes an eighth out of each. Times that now. 22k times 10. 220,000. 10 kilos of heroin. And what is it? The pure stuff ain't even there. Man are running after this stuff and the pure stuff ain't even there. So he's got 10 kilos in front of him. He gives it to his man's go on deal. They break it up. They make their own business out of it. And do you see how much money is available for someone who sees this? He's thinking, I'm making business now. This is the, the most attractive proposal to man. And what is the biggest thing that drives us Muslims today towards this? Money. Money is what drives us towards it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his time said to his companions, I do not fear that my ummah will ever commit shirk. They will never commit shirk. My ummah will never suffer the disease of shirk, of polytheism, of worshipping more than one Allah. 
they will always remain on, on the worship of one Allah. But he goes, the biggest disease that I fear my ummah will fall into, tanafasul mal, they're going to fight over money. And the amount that they're going to fight over money is what we see today. People want to get rich. If one guy sees a guy driving a Porsche Cayenne, or a Lamborghini, or a Range Rover, you see these materialistic things that we look at, they are going to look attractive in our eyes because they're polished well. You go to a shop and you see a blinging shoe, and you're going to look at it and you're going to think, this is the thing for me. I know, I, but you can't afford it. You can try all you can, but you can't afford it. How is he going to? The easiest and quickest way to make money today is the youth are going towards drugs. Why? Because it's all about money. That's what drives them. That's what gives them the injection. That's what motivates them. It's all about being rich. We know when you see these pop stars and all these people and how they live such a high, fly, high flying life and everything. Everyone aspires to that. That's who we look up to. That's who we want. So you, you, you get these people who are dealing with stuff like this. This business, you know, the drug street, how people are, are trying to deal it, how people are trying to make it happen for them. To make an objective and a mission in life. This is the mission in life for some people. All their life they wake up and they think of, how do I pick up, how do I drop off? When they go sleep, it's just about, how do I pick up, how do I drop off? Is there anything that else is in his mind? He might be looking like as if his, 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 uh, his attention and, and his focus is somewhere elsewhere. But in reality, it's not. Deep down, all he's thinking is what? In the mind of a drug dealer, all he's thinking is drugs. That's what craves him, that's his motivation, that's his movement, that's what drives him. And when you look at these people, you know, why do people take drugs? Financially, they're suffering. Emotional breakdown. Man's hit depression. Lad says, go and have some drugs. It clears your mind. <laughs> It clears your minds. Fine, for that moment in time, you might have a clear mind. You might be in your own zone, knocked up. But you know, in those drugs, there's something called the craving. It's that addiction. The addiction is in there. Once you smoke it once, you are addicted. You need, you need, you need. After that, it's just, it's just the way it is. There's that lezzat, there's that taste inside it for someone who smoked it once, twice, three times. Before you know it. Is, is, is a druggie. He's someone who's, who's regularly smoking these things. Why? Inside that substance is the craving. You know, we can, if, I, if, I were, if I was to offer someone a zoot today, this is just an example, I'm not going to do it. So please don't take me as that. And if you was to smoke it, and you said, oh, I, I can smoke it, it won't affect me. Go on then, smoke one on its own. Someone who is fresh, he'll never be able to smoke one on his own, he'll need help. He smokes it on his own. Believe within a week he'll be back and saying, you know what, that was wicked. You know the buzz I got in that. The, the, I was in my own world. All my tension, my stress, everything was just lifted. I was free. I was in my own zone. I had nothing. My mom could shout at me and I was <laughs> cuckoo land. <laughs> my dad could shout at me and I'm in my own world. I, you know, I, you know, the, you know, the funniest thing is, you know, when we go home or when, when a child goes home to his father and he's out of his head, he thinks his father doesn't know. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. You know, when he goes home and he thinks, my dad doesn't know what I'm on. <laughs> you know, our fathers, as much as they came from that country or from those towns, they're far ahead of us than we think they than we, when we they, you know, Just because they don't tell us doesn't mean they, do, they don't know. Of course they know. They know the symptoms of blood shot, blood, blood shot eyes, eyes are red, nails are starting to change, lips are starting to change color, teeth have got that, eyes are, you know, heart, he can't even, you know, take him for a game of football and he's panting after five minutes, man. <laughs> and the guy you're thinking, where is it? There's too much skunk. You know, you, you see them, there's too much of it. The effect of it is what? Physically, you're going to go. It's going to catch up on you. Cancer is going to get up. Fine, you know, one thing that we think is, yeah, you know, if I smoke it, it ain't going to happen to me. You know, I, one in a million case you've heard of a guy who smoked drugs and he got lung cancer. What's the chances that I will be there? That's exactly the thing. The probability of you being there is far greater than you thinking you're not going to be there. The chances of you destroying your own body are far greater than you thinking you ain't going to destroy your body. So the, the, the repercussions of these things, the conclusion and the effect of these things is what? Physically, 
It kills you. You see him, the man's very skinny. The man is... Uh, some you get who are big. Some you get who are medium. Some people it affects depending on how their physical metabolism works and how it reacts to these things. So you get physically there. One of the reasons why he takes it recreational, he just wants to abuse it. And you know the youth, you know I said they hit depression, most of the youth abuse it. They abuse these drugs. They just want to smoke it because they think it's cool. They just want to look big. They see you know, a generation above them. I'm 20 years old, the generation above me is 30. They see 30 year old smoking and they think, you know what, I, I, I want to try it out as well. It's cool. You know when you listen to Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, he has that track next episode. And what does he say in there? What's the chorus line? Smoke weed every day. <laughs> and you know today what do the youth do? Listen to rap. Listen to music. And what does music tell them? Weed, cocaine, skunk, sex, alcohol. That's all it ever talks about. And which track do you ever hear it saying, talking about sense? Even Tupac spoke about it. Biggie used to talk about it. Ten Crack Commandments. <laughs> He's always about the Ten Crack Commandments. You see all of these rappers and all the... Because they in that society, real business, they can rap with these words. Crack and smack. They, they use, play with the words and they put a good beat to it. And today, we inject it into our ears. We plug it into our ears. We listen to the very same thing. And we think it ain't affecting us. You know, when, when Biggie's beats are beating in your ears, and his lyrics you understand, before you know it, you are on the very same thing Biggie Smalls was on. Before you know it. Why? Because what are we injecting? You see, Islam emphasizes so much on what you put in your body. So much. That's why interest is haram. That's why alcohol is haram. That's why drugs is haram. Why? What are you putting into your body? What goes in must come back out. Do you ever have food that is stored all the time? Percentage of it is stored remains. Arola. And, and you see that what goes in has to come back out. If you feed yourself haram, what actions are you going to act with? This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to give immense, immense attention towards what you eat, immense attention to what you listen to, immense attention towards what, you, um, what your heart is thinking. He focused on the heart. He made people think and realize about the heart. So you have recreational, emotional, you have uh, reasons, financial and drug abuse. One of the reasons, and, and now this is uh, something that uh, the most important thing today. Why do people smoke drugs? The bottom line is money and respect. Everyone thinks about izzat. Everyone thinks about, I've got to have, you know, today, if I sit amongst my baladri and my system and my family, and they say, Subhanallah, Chaudhry Sahib's got so much money. Chaudhry Sahib's got, is vastly rich. They're not going to judge him by his kirdar or his akhlaq. They will not say he was a beautiful man with great akhlaq. He was a man on haq. He stood up. No. They're going to say he's a rich guy. Let's go dad up to him. Everyone judges someone by money today. When we see someone rich, we think this man's got izzat. He's got the luxuries of this dunya. What more do we need? And someone who doesn't have no money, what is it? You, look, you frown upon them. Why don't we look, look to the poor people as role models? Ask yourself this question. Why is it that today we don't look at the poor people in Africa and say, that's my role model for life? Why is it we look at the rich people and we take the rich people as role models? Because of the luxuries of life. No one has ever thought about it. No one has ever thought, I'll take a role model in a poor person. Bishr Hafi used to be an alcoholic. I was talking about him on Friday. Sayyidina Bishr Hafi one night was walking and all alcoholics swarmed him. And as a Bishr Hafi stood there crying, crying. And these alcoholics are around him. And you know, he's, he's crying because out of the fear of Allah from where he was and where he is. <laughs> Bishr Hafi is such a great waliullah, great Sufi, great Imam, great scholar of hadith of his time. The Imam and Ustaz of Hazrat Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal Rahmatullah Sayyidina Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal used to sit with him. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal used to sit with Bishr Hafi. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal's Muridin used to say to him, 
Hey, ya Ustaz, you are the Imam Mujtahid, you are an Imam of the greatest caliber. You know over a million ahadith according to yourself. You're a man of great caliber. Why do you sit with him? This guy was an ex-alcoholic. He doesn't wear no slippers on his shoes. On his feet, he wears no slippers. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal said, I might know about how to read your namaz and everything, but when I sit to him, he teaches me how to get to Allah. I might know how to, you know, I might teach people you should read namaz like this and everything. But Bishar Hafi, me sitting with him during day to, from the, after Isha till Fajr, me sitting with Bishar Hafi, <laughs> he directs me to Allah, he gives me guidance to Allah. And this was who? An ex-alcoholic. If he could change, why is it today we can't change? Bishar Hafi is the, the role model for us to follow. He was someone who used to drink alcohol immensely. Yet, a big sudden change in his life. And he became the Imam of his time, that the, the greatest scholars of that time, the Shaykh al-Islams of that time, the muj, Mujtahids of that time, the ones who did uh, uh, Mujaddids of that time, the revivers of that time, used to be the Shagirs of this man. So you have people who, who do it for honor and respect. People who do it for money. People who do it so they get women. People who do it so they can practice sexual activities in an illegal manner. Offer them, I get what I want, you get what you want. People do it for these reasons. These are reasons which drive man to dealing drugs and smoking drugs. Because why? We think it's cool. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned in his life many great things. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a role model for us. His sahaba were a role model for us. Those role models we have left. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beautiful ayat of the Quran. Allah Almighty says, there are those people who take those who don't believe in Allah and His Rasul as role models, as friends, in return that they think they will give them good. We take people who are going to do bad for us, we think they'll give us good. Why? The good we think they're going to give is what? Material. Materialism is what drives us today. 